なと思います。
we have another year that we can uh, continue to feed the mice and each other. <laughs> they asked, well, how are we going to get rid of the mice? I said, it's very simple. We're going to baptize them, we're going to make them members, and we will never see them again. <laughs> or you said a cat. Or, or a cat. <laughs> the, the alternative is we get a, a, a church cat. Uh, again, tomorrow is obviously Christmas Eve. I think we all know that. And we have our traditional family service at 7 o'clock. It's going to be heavy on music, heavy on the Christmas uh, readings, and light on me preaching. So that's good. So uh, I, I only do a short meditation. Yes, you can clap at that. I just do a short meditation. But we'll start at 7, that way we get everyone home before it gets uh, too late at night. And we invite you all to please come out and join us for that. And if that's all, I think we're ready to enter into our worship.
in the lighting of our fourth heaven. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45, found on page 53 in your Bible. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> You would turn to page 12 in your hymnal and we join together in our prayer of confession. One heart and in one voice. Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us rise and offer each other signs of reconciliation and love. <laughs>
Yeah. Is it going to move? Can you tell me the station? Or where did, how do you log in to look at it? One is umc.org, or just YouTube. You search for it. We're on YouTube. Let's we'll see if somebody at that place can get my mother. She's in the memory care unit. Yeah. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Have a blessed Christmas. Yes, you too. It's a Merry Christmas.
wise men that came from the east because they saw the star. And then what do you think this one is? A W. And what do you think W stands for? Worship. <coughs> It stands for worship because the angels worshipped him in the in the sky before the, when they talked about the <coughs> and we should worship him today, right? Okay. So to remind everybody, the coffee hour later, if I brought enough M and M's to share, <laughs> and I brought some Rio.
Though this probably does not come as a surprise to many of you. You've all seen it, you all know it. My wife and I spat like cats and dogs. <coughs> Tuesday morning, I had woken up, and I was going to be good. I wasn't going to go to the diner for breakfast, I was going to save that money that day. And we started spatting about something, it doesn't even matter what, I don't even remember. And I said, that's it, I'm going out, boom, 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 boom. And I go and I head down to Granny's for breakfast. Because I just had to get out of the house, otherwise we would just fight and we'd get worse. And I firmly believe, firmly believe, God wanted me to go to the diner that morning. Not because I was hungry or because the food was, you know, any better than it always is. It's always good there. But I sat down in my usual spot, and I usually sit with my back to the wall and I kind of look at the rest of the people in the diner. And I started overhearing conversations, because when all your other senses is going and all you have left is hearing, you hear grass grow. So I'm listening. And right next to me, the table next to me, there's these two lovely ladies. And the first thing I hear that the older of the two say is, it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters what church you go to. They're all God's houses. And I just start smiling. And she looks over at me and she goes, what did I say? And I said, well, I'm a pastor and I couldn't happen to agree with you more. And that just kicked off a 30-minute conversation that the three of us had as we had our breakfast and we talked. And I met a woman, her name is Connie. She's 89 years old. Connie was an angel. She is an angel. She doesn't have wings. She doesn't have a halo. Oh, she, she has such a love in her for Jesus. It was beautiful. She was talking about how she liked to help people you know, even at her age, she, she, she did what she can. How she, God made her a good steward of her money so that she was able to provide for people, you know, to, to work with, you know, soup kitchens. Not just give them money. She actually still works at 89 in the soup kitchens uh, to, you know, donate clothes, to go through a house and find things that she can give away. How she just loves to talk to people and visit them when they're not feeling well and to tell them how much Jesus loves them. She is truly, truly a Christian angel. And a good model for what we should all be. And it was, it was refreshing to meet her. It really was. To, to feel the love that poured out of this tiny, frail little thing. She had so much to give. It was bursting. And you could see it in her face. Her face was radiant. She lit the room up. She was infectious. She was easy to talk to. She really has a powerful, powerful love for Jesus Christ. And that's what we should all have. And this season, if it reminds us of nothing else, it should remind us of that. How much we love Christ. How much Christ loves us. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this. And he laid down his life for a friend or a brother. And that's what Christ did for each and every one of us. He laid down his life so that we didn't have to. And that story starts tomorrow night in a manger. That's the beginning of the story. The greatest story ever told. The most powerful story that we've ever experienced as a people. The story of Emmanuel, God with us, Christ come to be a part of our life. And not just a part, but really the focus. If we're really honest, Christ deserves to be the focus of our life. He deserves to be the center. And everything we do should wrap around this one man and God. He deserves our first fruits. He deserves our very best. Because he didn't hold anything back for us. His detractors said when he was on the cross, if you're so powerful, call on the angels. They'll take you down. They'll save you. And they were right. They could have. And he could have called on them. And his father would have answered. But he chose not to. 
He chose to endure the cross as a flood for each and every one of us. How can we do anything less than tell the world? How can we do anything less than live the life that he bought for us to the fullest potential that we can? <coughs> we owe God all that we have. Like Connie, we need to be good stewards of our resources, not just our money. Our most precious resource, our time, that thing which we can't buy or replace, can't trade or give away, we can only spend it. We need to be good stewards of our choices, that we make the right decisions that support Christ and his mission in this world. And then we need to go out and be the hands and feet that perform that mission. <clears throat> we can't just sit at home and leave it to others. We have to do it. Otherwise, it's never going to get done. We have to. And love, love is the way. It's a powerful, powerful way. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, Faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity. The more modern versions say faith, hope, and love. Charity is the Greek word that comes from charos, which is a form of love. It's giving love. It's just a different way of saying love. And love is powerful. I can remember when I was uh, in youth group, our youth leader told us a story of two young men. They'd grown up together in the same town. This was right during the Vietnam era. And uh, they were the best of friends. They were basically brothers with different moms. And they both enlisted. One ended up becoming an officer, and the other became a soldier, a private in the unit. And they were in the same unit. And they were sent over to Vietnam. And the officer, for whatever reason, was about 50, 60, 70 yards away from their encampment when the enemy attacked and he got wounded and uh, fell to the ground. He was too far out for the medics to get to him safely and he was too badly wounded to make it back on his own. But his friend saw this, leapt out of their bunker and started to his brother. You could see, they said, him getting hit all the way out. The, the fire was tremendous. But he got there, bent down, picked up his friend, and carried him back to safety. Then he collapsed and died. The amazing part of the story is what happened afterwards. The medics, once everything had settled down, started examining him. They stopped counting his wounds at 200. More than 200. They said he must have died on the way out. But adrenaline and courage and love. Love. Kept him going. <coughs> Saved his friend's life. <coughs> Most of us will never be called to show that depth of love. That courage. But we are called to die for each other, and to die for Christ, to be born again, to die to the things that we want over what others need, to die to our choices when they differ from God's plans and God's choices, to die to our old selfish selves 
so that we can be made anew, born again in the vision of Christ. Some people will be born again just once. Some will be born again every day. And some somewhere in between. It's not a scary term, even though it picked up some real bad connotations in the 70s and 80s. It doesn't mean we're out there being crazy Jesus freaks. It just means that we love Christ and we share Him with the world. And we let Him and the Holy Spirit and the Father transform us from the people we chose to be to the people God made us to be. And it takes time. There's nothing wrong with that. It takes time. I have a young man I work with, very nice, very huge, huge guy, makes me look tiny. And you know, like most really big guys, they tend to be gentle giants. And he's very sensitive. And he said to me the other day something about being friends. And I, and I looked at him very seriously. I said, Carl, he said, we're not friends. He said, I've only known you four months. And he, he was a little hurt by it, I can tell. But I said, we've begun to be friends. We may someday be friends. I hope we are. I said, Carl, that takes about 10 years for me to make a friend. Mm -hmm. He looked at me like, what do you mean? I said, well, you have to understand that to me, the word friend is a very, very powerful word. I said, we're acquaintances and we're co-workers and we're friendly and we're nice to each other. But I said, my friends are the people that I wouldn't hesitate to take a bullet for. They're my family that I choose and that I love, even if I wasn't born into their family. And I said, I hope someday we get to that point. I would love that. But that takes time. We don't just have that relationship overnight. It takes years to develop that type of love, that type of caring, that type of selflessness. It's a great thing once you achieve it. And I wish everyone does, and I'm sure you do. I'm sure you have people like that in your life. God is that way for each and every one of us. God died because His love for each and every one of us was so great. And we're all His friends. Even the ones who were putting Him on the cross. Think about that a minute. Even the ones who were nailing Him to the cross died for them. Because their sin against him was no greater, no worse than the least that we have done. Doesn't matter if you steal a penny or a million dollars, it's stealing. Doesn't matter if you kill somebody or you wish them dead, it's murder. It's murder in your soul. It's a stain on your soul until God's love washes it away. It just doesn't matter. Now this Christmas season, there's a story that really, really, to me, tells the power of God's love in the world better than almost anything else. And that's the story of the fourth Magi. Now Anne told, when she told, told to Amelia, she spoke of the three wise men. And when we have our manger set, we have three wise men, and a lot of our carols are three wise men. We really don't know how many wise men there were. It says that there were wise men, plural, bearing three gifts. So there could have been two, three, fifty, a hundred. We don't know. And it doesn't really matter. But the important thing is, is what they did. They came to acknowledge the presence of the king, the Lord of Lords. King of Kings. And someone, I, I forget who, if it was Oscar Wilde, or somebody wrote a story some years ago about the fourth wise man. And this wise man had started out with his other three friends. He was bearing a small casket, probably about the size of our hymnal, that had three gems in it. And these two were going to give to the baby Jesus and his family. But along the way, a sandstorm had come up and he had gotten separated from the other three wise men. So he didn't make it to Bethlehem in time. By the time he reached Bethlehem, Herod had already started killing the children, 
the family had been warned, and they had fled to safety in Egypt. But he was relentless. He was dedicated. He was going to get these three gems to the Christ. And so he started searching for them. And his search took him all up and down <coughs> Israel and Judea and Egypt. But he kept missing them. And at one point in his search, maybe ten or so years into it, he's in a city, he has heard some rumors that Christ, there was someone there that might fit the description. So he's looking for him. And he saw a young woman and her child sitting against the wall. And they were obviously very hungry. They were starving. They didn't have money for food or milk or anything. And they were going to die. And he looked down at his casket and he said, well, you know, I have three gems. If I give her one so she can buy food for herself and her child, I still have two nice gems to give to the Christ. So he did that. He took out one of the stones, he gave it to her. He said, go and buy food for you and your child. And she thanked him profusely, obviously, because he had saved her life. So he kept searching, he kept searching, and he kept searching, and he kept missing Christ. Every time he got somewhere near where he thought he had heard about him, he'd already moved on. So about another 10 years go by, it's been about 20 years now, and he's in another area, and this poor <coughs> older gentleman is very, very sick, he's sitting by the springs outside the city. He's obviously dying. He doesn't have any money for medicine. He can't go see a physician. And the wise man sees him. He says, well, I have two gems left. If I give one to this man so that he can go and see a doctor and get medicine, I still have a beautiful gem to give the Christ child when I meet him. So that's what he does. He opens up his casket. He's guarded very carefully these 20 years. He takes out one of his two precious stones, he hands it to the man, he says, go, go get a doctor, get the medicine you need, rest, recover, and live. And the man does, and he thanks him again profusely because he saved his life. And he's continuing his search, and he's continuing his search, and this is when Jesus' ministry is about to begin, so now he's becoming very famous. Now he's hearing where he is all over the place. And he keeps trying to get to him, he keeps trying to get to him. He keeps missing him. And again, he's in a city where Christ may or may not have been, or is still somewhere in the city, and he sees a family who are about to be sold into slavery. And they look so miserable. And his heart is so moved and it's so broken by the fate that's about to fall his family. He can't just let it happen. But he's only got one stone left. But he takes the stone and he pays for the family. And then he sets them free. And of course, they are tremendously happy and thankful. They don't know what to say. And he starts just wandering around because, well, he's failed. In his mind, it's over with. He's given away all his riches. He has nothing left for the Christ. And he's wandering, he's wandering, he's wandering. And he comes to a small mountain outside of Jerusalem. He sees three men hanging on crosses. He looks in the eyes of the one in the center, and he knows instantly this is who he's been seeking. <clears throat> this is the Christ. But it's just as empty. He has nothing. He can't bribe the guards to free him. He can't even spend anything on him to have a decent place for him to be buried. He has no gift to give. He falls to the foot of the cross. He 
tears flowing down his cheek. And he's weeping. He's sorrow. And in the midst of Christ's agony, he has compassion for this man's suffering. She says, hey, you poor, foolish, wise man. Don't you know what you've done? No, Lord, what? He says, every gift, every one of those stones that you gave to the least <coughs> of my brothers and sisters, you gave to me. It was me you fed. It was me you healed. It was me you set free. And I accept each and to everyone <clears throat> in the love in which you gave it. And that's what we're called to do. To have that sort of sacrificial love. To feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give some who's thirsty something to drink. Visit with those who need visiting. Console those who need comfort. That's what we're going to do Christmas Day. <coughs> we'll have time with our families to be sure. Whether before or after or during. But we're going to serve others. And even if it's only for a few hours, we're going to give them a little bit of hope. We're not just giving them turkey and stuffing or lasagna. Trust me, the lasagna is good. We're going to give them hope. We're going to build up their faith and their trust, even if it's just a little. We're going to remind them that they too have value and are loved. And it's a beautiful thing that we do that on Christmas. It's a beautiful thing now that we're able to do that this Thanksgiving. It would be a truly beautiful thing to do that every day. And we can. We may not be able to feed 400 a day, but we can feed one. We can visit one. We can comfort one. And if we all did that little bit, there would be a lot of love in the world. So that's what I want you to remember this Christmas. Remember the love. Remember the season of love. But most importantly, remember it doesn't end on December 26 at 1201. It goes on and on and on and on. And Christmas can be every day of the year. Amen if you choose to make it so. Amen? Amen. 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 <coughs> Amen. Mr. Stephen, I wanted to do something. A song that's a little special. It's a beautiful song that's very, become very popular these days. It's not in our hymnal, though. But uh, we wanted to do it together for you. And uh, it's Mary, did you know? <coughs> Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know 
that your baby boy will calm a storm with his hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you've kissed your little baby, then you've kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will walk, the dumb will see, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb? This sleeping child you're holding is a great time of the year, a holy time, a time when people are just a little quicker to be nicer to one another, a little gentler, a little more caring, a little more thoughtful. And our prayer is that that could be the case each and every day of the year. And we know it starts with us, and it comes from you. So we ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with us all the days of this year, that your mercy and your compassion and your love for humanity be felt in us, in our leaders, in all the people whose lives we come into contact with. Our world needs so much more love. We can never have too much love. And so we ask, <clears throat> we ask that it flow through us and into the world. And we lift up names and people and places as a reminder to you that we are willing to be in partnership in our prayers and in our acts and in our words as we are ambassadors of the living Christ. And I ask for Sherry and Todd that they be free from their pain. Heavenly Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, the risen Christ. And we know that you hear them, that he hears them, that the Holy Spirit is already at work in the world. But we ask, Lord, 
you work a little harder? Could you work a little faster? Because we need it. You can't do it alone, Lord. We need you. So come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come, Emmanuel. And be with us. Amen. Amen. And now is the opportunity for us to return to God a portion of that which he has blessed us with.
Sunday of 2018, we're going to have our regular service. Two Sundays from now, we'll have our first service of the new year, and Annie and I will be cooking breakfast for everyone, and we're going to have our uh, service around the table in the fellowship hall, which has become a tradition ever since the first year when I was here, and we had no power. So we had to go out to there to have the oven on to actually stay warm. So that'll be two Sundays from now. We hope you can all come and join us for breakfast and uh, Holy Communion, old church style, home church style. And uh, we look forward to that. Receive now the benediction. May the road rise to greet thee. May the wind be always at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face. May the rains lay gentle on your field, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palms of his hand. Go forth from this sanctuary, this place of love, and be loved to the world. Merry, Merry Christmas. I hope to see you all tomorrow night. Amen. Amen. Amen.